Well, kia ora tēnā so, uh, to probably a very sleepy group of Kiwis all around New Zealand, darling, and at 7.30 a.m. in the morning on Friday the 1st of May in Auckland, New Zealand, uh, and we welcome everybody dialing in for the latest episode of Leadership from Lockdown. If you're dialing in from international um, audiences, and we actually have quite a few people registered from all over the world uh, this week, which I think uh, probably signifies the importance of the, the amazing guest that we have with us today and the work that she's been doing on the international stage around developing women's sports. So very excited to have her here with us uh, this week. Um, for those of you who've been dialing in every week, this will be old hat for you now, so a uh, bit of housekeeping for you. You can ask questions live of our guest speaker, so our moderator will take us through a few questions first up, and then we'll dive straight into uh, audience questions. Uh, and then towards the end, uh, we'll also pop back in and we'll have a quick poll for you all uh, just to ask you how you're feeling right now uh, as we head into, well, the end of the first week of our uh, tier three lockdown in New Zealand and obviously all around the world people are experiencing different uh, challenges around COVID-19. So welcome everybody. I'm uh, without further ado going to hand over to our amazing moderator who keeps agreeing every week to get up early to do uh, these sessions, uh, Ricky Swanau. Ricky. Thanks Rachel. Morning everybody uh, in New Zealand. I hope you've had a really good uh, first week at level three and managed to get your coffees and your takeaways and have got courier packages arriving like I have. And hello to everyone who's joining us around the world. It's really great to have you along with us for these sessions and it's great to have uh, Katie Sadlier with us, World Rugby's General Manager for Women's Rugby coming to us from Dublin. Katie's been in that role since 2017. So Katie, we always like to find out first of all how bubble life is in other countries. We call it bubbles here in New Zealand. What's the, the situation like in Dublin? Yeah, well, we call it bubble here as well. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's interesting, it's challenging, just the same as it is in most places around the world. Uh, I've been um, in lockdown now for seven weeks working from home. Um, it looks like that that's probably likely to get extended. We're supposed to kind of have a refresh statement uh, on Monday. We've got a, a long weekend here. Um, and, I, and what that means is, um, you know, stay at home, be safe. Uh, you are allowed out for exercise, which is you know, really important. So I do get out in the morning very, very early um, for a walk within our two, we have a, a two kilometer bubble, um, but um, it, you know, it's shopping's restricted to groceries and, and medical supplies, the same as, as you, um, so it's, it's, I live by myself, so it's, it's um, uh, reasonably interesting days in terms of my routine. Um, I have all my family in New Zealand still, so I touch base early in the morning and late at night, and then I do my day job. Yeah. You're like me. You always win the arguments, though, when you're a bubble of one, if, when you talk to yourself. Conversation's a little bit limited sometimes. Seven weeks Absolutely. is a long time to be working from home, though, and I know World Rugby staff are spread across so many areas. How have you all stayed con stay connected in that, then? Uh, well, I mean, you know, like this, Zooming, Zooming, Zooming um, all day. Um, every now and then you try and break it up and, and use the old telephone just to um, remind yourself that... You don't actually have to look at a, a flat screen, but very, very connected. I mean, we, we, you've got the casual uh, calls, which are just really about, you know, the, the personal um, one-on-ones. And then we have, um, World Rugby has got about 120 staff globally. Um, probably two thirds of them live in, in Dublin or in the UK, but we have um, what we call a town hall once every two and a half weeks now, where the chief executive addresses everyone. So kind of massive Zooms down to, um, just connecting with people on a regular basis. Wow. Um, so your portfolio is leading women's rugby globally. As I said, you've been in that job for, for a couple of years. What have the challenges been for you in the, in the past six, seven weeks? And, and I guess, how have you prioritised dealing with those challenges? You know, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I guess I have been given the opportunity to talk about this a, a bit lately with different kind of media. And, and I spend a lot of time with other international sports federations, just comparing notes about where we're at and where we're not and some of the challenges. And I think that, you know, in reflection, the challenges um, in terms of what we're trying to do in, in rugby have possibly just been escalated, but they were challenges that were identified when we set a new strategic direction for how we wanted to accelerate the global development of women. So when I got on board, um, it was very much at the time where rugby was capitalizing on a very successful Olympic Games and great exposure and, and the numbers were going up. 
But we knew as a, as a global organization that there was a long way to go to normalize women's involvement in rugby um, on and off the field. So we developed a, a strategy which um, was focused on how we could accelerate the global development of women, um, knowing that there were some gaps to, uh, to address. So the strategy is still the strategy. So what it's really, it's given us is during this period of time is just to reflect on why we put what we put in there and what areas of that you can push and what areas might slightly be on, on pause, but ultimately, um, you know, what we're trying to achieve is still the same. And uh, my role is to actually make sure that we, we deliver that within, within the next eight years. Have you identified areas that you can, that you can push that this might present an opportunity? Absolutely. And, you know, you know, the, the strategy has got five pillars, so it's not unlike most other um, domestic national sport organization strategies or other internationals. The, the pillars are, you know, grow your participation. And we're looking at doubling the number of our registered numbers. It's about um, creating aspirational, inspirational competitions. So really upping the ante on your high performance and your product leadership, inspirational leadership on and off the field um, profile with impact. How do we really lift the profile of women's rugby? And then linked to that also is driving a sustained and diverse in new income streams to actually support the, the development of the game. And so when you look at that, I mean, clearly the participation side is in a bit of a pause, at, as we know, and hopefully we'll, we're working on strategies on how we can return to play. But where we did focus initially, and, and that's now more important than ever, is the leadership work stream. And you know, it was one of the, the first things that World Rugby did was to recognize that we needed to really progress in terms of our um, commitment to diversity and equity in terms of how we manage our sport. Um, so major transformational changes at a governance level. And then a lot of the work that I do is about building the pipelines of, of leaders um, for senior positions inside unions, um, for coaches on fields, for, for match officials. And we're spending a lot of time um, building those networks that we've we've invested in to make sure that they now have the opportunity to really lead in in what is a, a challenging environment so that's a really important thing and then the profile bit you know it's you know ultimately what we're trying to do is to make sure that when you look and you think about rugby that you absolutely think it's a sport that's played by girls and boys women and men so this is a fantastic time to be developing profiles to make sure that our content on our websites and our and any kind of publications that are being developed are, are really show girls and boys, women and men. So it, it is, it's about balancing um, and lifting the profile of women's rugby. Yeah, World Rugby's been doing a great job on their social with um, old matches, men and women and stuff, yeah. which has been really, really cool to see and, and cool to watch as, as well. Um, we had Sarai Behrman on um, with us last week from FIFA, and I know you guys are regularly in touch. Very close. Yeah, very <laughs> close. And, and you, you and Sarai and the ICC, you all sort of teamed up and, and had a message out in media a couple of weeks ago about some concerns uh, for women's sport around COVID. What are your areas of concern with that and, and for women's rugby in particular? Yeah, I mean, we do. Um, Holly Colvin, who's the chief women's cricket officer based in Dubai. So there's, there's Soraya based in Zurich, myself in Dublin and, and, um, and Holly in Dubai. We do meet on a weekly basis now. So we, we've always met quite regularly, but now we, we've upped the ante on that and talking, 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 learning and observing about what's actually going on, both within our codes and others. Um, you know, you know, there's there's similar challenges. There's, there, sometimes the things that we're talking about are the opportunities more than the challenges. There's certainly a lot more sharing that's going on and collaborating across codes in terms of coming up with joint solutions and making sure that we are supporting each other. Um, you know, critiquing each other's board papers, which look at COVID, COVID impacts, um, and having a look at some of the resources that need to be put in place now to make sure that we don't lose any of the gains. Um, so whilst we're working together on some of the solutions and the challenges, we were also working very closely together on how we actually progress the development of our, our sports. Um, and so, you know, it's still early days and we were spending a lot of time listening um, and people are at different stages uh, around the globe. I know I bring together the leaders inside um, the, the major unions that have uh, very robust women's programs and, you know, from Hong Kong, where you're talking to Sam and she's still working in the Hong Kong offices, through to others who are definitely working, you know, in at home, um, isolated cases. So, you know, getting that reconnectivity, um, making sure that the woman's aspect of the game is still very much being advocated for. Um, I think that's the kind of a, a major challenge and it's something that 
rugby has really taken on board. Um, we say that women's rugby um, and are committed to the fact that women's rugby is the strategic growth area for the game. And with that, that means that, um, that we have a series of people that are advocating for that inside world rugby and around the globe to make sure that, that it, it is front and center um, while we're looking at business recovery packages as well. Are there opportunities that exist right now for women's rugby that or possibly not right now, but when we get through the other side of this, that you can really look to jump on quite quickly and um, with the planning that's gone in over these, over these weeks? Yeah, there is. And, and you know, there's, it's, it's really quite good timing this, because we are about to launch something that I think is very special um, in the next week. Um, so, I mean, I'll just talk a little bit about it in advance um, because I'm sure everyone will share the secret. <laughs> but we've, we've been working a lot on um, coaching uh, and that's a big area. So in our leadership work stream, we work on um, how we support people who are in, in governance roles, senior management roles. And, we, and, and in those two areas, we have a kind of a series of executive leadership scholarships. And there's about 37 women now over the last three years that have been allocated a significant professional development opportunity. They're, they are very well networked in terms of it's a, it's a group of people who support each other. Um, I'm trying to meet with them every two weeks to talk about what's going on uh, globally in their unions. And it ranges from Uganda to Peru to, to um, North America to Fiji. It's an incredibly diverse group of, of, of amazing women who have a huge role in terms of um, women's rugby now and in the future. Um, but one of the big areas in that leadership stream that we addressed, uh, you know, I, I guess it was something that, that we saw after the last World Cup in 2017, it became very, very clear that we don't have many women in senior high performance coaching roles around the world. Um, we're, not, I'm, we're not unique in that capacity compared to other codes, but it was really, really obvious when I did an analysis back then that said out of the top 16 women's, um, six women's sevens programs and 15s programs, there was only one country in the world that had a woman as a head coach. So that's out of those, those um, you know, that whole big group. And there was about four that were in assistant coach capacity. So we started a, a process um, a while ago where we um, contracted uh, one of our World Rugby Hall of Famers, Carol Isherwood, who I'm pretty sure you would know, Ricky, very famous um, rugby player from, from England, who's been working with me to completely review and come up with some strategic recommendations and activations on how we um, grow diversity in our coaching teams and substantially increase the number of women in coaching um, in leadership positions. And so that's been a huge piece of work. And, and what she's been working on, you know, part of that, yeah, there was a whole series of recommendations, which were quite holistic. We've got about 120 coaches around the world now that are on a, a global database that we're mentoring and supporting. But one of the things that we've been working on is a, um, what we call a women's rugby toolkit, which is a resource that we will be launching uh, and providing for unions and clubs, which looks at the, the major issues and barriers to getting more women involved in coaching and coaching leaderships and what unions can be doing in terms of developing that aspect of the human resources for on-field leadership. So that's a really big one. And there's, there's lots of things like that that are going on, but it's, you know, to have kind of concrete tools which address di diversity issues where people who have time right now can Zoom together and review and reflect where they're at. And we're hoping to really change the look and feel of um, our coaching workforce. Oh, that's great to hear, yeah. Coaching is just such a big issue across the board for so many sports. Um, obviously, Rugby World Cup is coming to New Zealand uh, towards the end of, of 2021. What are, your, what are your hopes um, for that tournament? It's the second one you've had during your time there, and the, the, the one in Ireland in 2017 was just so fabulous. This is um, the first one, though, since, you've, since the new strategy has been implemented. So what are your hopes for the tournament next year? Well, it's going to be amazing, clearly. I mean, Obviously. New Zealand really does amazing events. Uh, you know, rugby is, is part of the culture down there. Um, there's a fantastic team of people working within the New Zealand Rugby Union um, with the tournament director, Michelle Hooper, um, and the chair of the organizing committee, Judy Christie, Dame Judy Christie. Um, there's a great plan in place to make sure that this is the, this is the next Rugby World Cup. I mean, that was one of the, the changes that we made as part of our, our, um, our global women's strategy was to take out neutral naming of our tournaments and to recognize them all equally. Um, 
So uh, New Zealand Rugby has come up with a fantastic ambition for this tournament uh, and that we're working alongside them and that is about inspiring all New Zealanders to to embrace the celebration of rugby and um, globally charging the game. And that's where I guess my role is, is to come in and see how we make the most of this tournament so that we have it accessible um, for viewers all around the world um, rather than just the people inside, inside New Zealand. So it's going to be an amazing event. So, you know, we have got some challenges with it. You know, we've, you know, as you know, it's, uh, I talk about 2021 as being the golden year for women's rugby. I don't think the, there'll ever be a, a time again, hopefully, that you've got the Olympic Games and a Rugby World Cup so close together and in the same year. So, you know, that provides such an amazing opportunity in terms of uh, a long-term profile campaign about lifting the game. Um, but all around, you know, the planning is on, in place. Um, we're working very closely with New Zealand Rugby and their um, host organizing committee. We have monthly meetings um, across the whole gambit of things that are important to get right and it's going to be a really exciting time. On that, and, and for those who don't know, obviously with the Olympics moving, there are some players that do shift between sevens and fifteens. New Zealand had, had quite a few that hoped to do that. What can World Rugby do to accommodate those teams and those unions and players, and some who don't have the big talent pool that need their sevens players to come over for fifteens? Yep. I mean, we're, we are talking regularly with the unions. I mean, right now there's nine out of the 12 teams have qualified for the World Cup in 2021. Six of those are also in the Olympic Games. Um, there is a seven week window uh, between when they finish the women's um, event in um, Tokyo and the first game in New Zealand. So that does provide a, a challenge where there is an overlap, but, but what we can say is that there is um, less and less of an overlap. I mean, there are still some countries that, that, you know, that it is substantive, but you know, back when um, 2017 was on, there was certainly quite a, a, a bigger overlap than there has been before. But you know, part of our work is, is, is not to say that people shouldn't be able to play sevens and fifteens. And, and that's one of our challenges in terms of where we're going in our international global calendar post 2021 to make sure that, you know, there are opportunities, but there will be crossovers. But if we're really committed to growing the game, then we're committed to growing the game in both formats and, um, and working with unions to make sure that they they have the, um, the capacity to do that as well. So the coaches are talking to each other now. Um, you know, it's, you know, we, as we said, we consult them about um, the challenge and, uh, and yeah, it, it will be challenging for some, um, but it, it, is, it is what people are sort of saying is that, it, that it's the right thing to do. We want, we want, we're not talking about changing the dates of the World Cup. New Zealand has an incredibly busy year in 2021. Um, and so we'll be looking at how we can move other events around that. Oh, it's exciting regardless. It's a good problem to have, I guess. We'll move, we'll move over to the questions that are coming in um, from everybody at home because I'm always conscious. I never get through them all. I try and rush through. So um, we'll start at the top here. And what are your current thoughts about the turmoil in Australian rugby? Um, and what, the, what do you see for the future there? Um, well, I do know that um, I work very, very closely with um, Jilly Collins who has a similar role to Kate Sexton in New Zealand rugby. And she's an amazing leader. You know, she mentors some of our scholarship um, women. Um, we ha have connected all the women in those kind of leadership roles to actually start talking about some of their challenges and some of their, um, the ways that they can work together. Um, you know, that there are a few global organizations um, around the world, unions that have had significant financial challenges in terms of um, pre and post COVID situations. Um, our role is to make sure that, that we have a, a really good product in terms of women's rugby in sevens and fifteens and Australia is, has got some very strong programs there. So we, we will work very closely with Jilly to make sure that she can see her way through this. What do you expect to see, where do you expect to see or what do you expect to see in women's rugby in four years time? Well, the crystal ball gazing, if you've done your job. Ball okay, well, I mean, I, I've got some pretty hefty um, goals. I mean, when we set up the strategy, it's an eight year strategy. And we did, you know, I've put in some bureaucrat speak. We put together a performance scorecard against each of the, the, the streams, which has got some pretty ambitious um, high level success statements against participation. And, you know, it is, it's a sport that's growing and growing. We've had 28% increase year on year in terms of women's rugby participation numbers. But we started off by saying we wanted to double the number of women playing rugby globally and increase the number of countries that are playing. And we're seeing that. We're, you know, people always get amazed when I say, 
if you looked at the number that there are, you know, 10,000 women playing rugby in Iran, that kind of blows people's minds. So, you know, it's happening. So significant increase in participation numbers. We're looking to um, have a very integrated global um, annual competition calendar. Um, and we've been working for quite some time on populating that calendar for the 15s game. We, we recognize that we've got a great sevens product in the seven series, but there, if you weren't in the six nations, there wasn't a lot of uh, offering out there for 15. So we've been working on, on an, an, a new expanded 15s program. Leadership, well, we, we're trying to change the look and feel of um, government structures. You know, it's, we did go from zero to 35% women on World Rugby Council in, in the first year of our strategy, but we need to work with the unions. Fantastic news down in New Zealand. I saw the press release that came out yesterday about the New Zealand board. Yes, that's fantastic. I'm looking forward to, to meeting the new board member, um, but that's excellent. But, you know, we have a role all the way around the globe to make sure that our boards are diverse and that they're representing our stakeholders. Um, clearly more coaches, you know, when it comes to the World Cup in 20. 25, um, I have a, we have a vision that says they'll have 40% of all the coaches will be women. Um, impact for profile, they, you know, like I said before, it, we are really working hard to increase the, the content on all our social media to get to increase the fans. Um, and then one of the really important ones um, is that we launched a commercial program, a, a bespoke commercial strategy for women's rugby this year. That's had to have a little bit of a pause, although we are still in negotiation with some potential, to some, um, potential partners, but it's a difficult time. But we've made the call to unbundle our rights, um, and we're one of the few international federations that has done that. And, and by that, I mean, up until now, when you sold the rights to the Men's World Cup, you also got thrown in the Women's World Cup. Um, but now we've said, no, the Women's World Cup is something and w women's rugby is something that can stand on its own. And we've unbundled it and we're in the market for six global commercial partners for women's rugby. So if we can get all those things over the line um, and people, are, well, it's, you know, no, um, they're, they're, they're kind of, some of them are pretty high order, but um, I would love that to be what it looks like when I depart. Good lofty goals. It probably actually ties in quite nicely with a couple of the questions that sort of follow up on with this. And um, what are the strategies for growing rugby in the smaller countries and the emerging nations then? And what sort of growth are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the smaller nations, to be honest, it's growing so much more rapidly than it is in the, um, the traditional nations. But in saying that, New Zealand and Australia have had some amazing, amazing growth. So some of the major markets have. Um, you know, I guess they started with the Sevens program and that inspired programs to get up and running. But now what we're seeing is, is that, um, you know, take a country like you know, some of the African nations in Uganda, or Tunisia, or, or Kenya, you know, when they started off with their sevens programs, but to really, one of the things that is a, a real quality of our game is that we say it's a, it's a, a game for all shapes and sizes. Um, and the sevens is an amazing dynamic athletic game. Um, and I'm not that the, the 15s isn't, but the 15s caters for a much wider group. So we're sort of trying to work with the the, the unions that have started off with sevens to also look at how they expand into some of their 15s programs. Um, but once again, we have, um, we have six regional associations that have varying aspects of either um, kind of women's development managers. Rugby Africa just recently appointed um, one of our executive leadership scholarships as a, the general manager for women's rugby in Africa. So her role is to work with unions right, like, like I have globally to actually see what can happen to actually grow the games. And, and it's, um, you know, it's everything from, we, we launched this year a major uh, marketing campaign called Try and Stop Us, Start Rugby, Become Unstoppable. And that was about creating resources for unions that didn't have big marketing budgets to actually help them get people to start talking about rugby and the values of rugby and, and why you would get involved. And so we are seeing um, amazing growth in countries like India, Pakistan, Malaysia, you know, Uganda. It, it, it's, it's, um, in my first year, I, I had the opportunity because I was developing the strategy. So I, I, you know, this is an absolutely fantastic job. You, you get to go around the world and meet amazing people and see some amazing things. And my first regional uh, general assembly was to go to Mongolia, to Ulaanbaatar, and they play snow rugby up there, the woman. Um, so that was just an absolutely amazing experience. So we, people forget it's not just about sevens and fifteens. World rugby is the governing body for rugby. So we have beach and snow and we have variations of the sevens and the fifteens as well. So there's lots of different formats to get people excited about participating. And I guess, and still a couple of these do follow on. What about in the Pacific Islands? What's some of the data around there, around women's coaching um, and leadership positions? Obviously, it's very close to us here in New Zealand. 
Yeah, I, and, and that's one of the really exciting things about hosting the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand in 2021. Um, as part of the bid New Zealand put forward, uh, they talked about how they were going to develop the Pacific and Oceania. And so their legacy program, they have a, a legacy program or what I would call an impact beyond program, which looks at how they can capitalize on hosting a major event down here to help the Pacific nations. Um, and, and, and doing that across a range of things from leadership development to young girls um, skills development to coaching and match officials. So they, there is definitely plans in place on how um, this event will be used to develop the, to the game. But I also want to say is that Oceana, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of Oceana. It, it does amazing things. Um, that's one of our regional associations, the Oceana Rugby Association, has got some, some really impressive leaders um, that work in the islands. Um, they've got some amazing partnerships with UN Women um, and more recently Child Fund Pass It Back and do extensive programs um, with young people. We, we have a global program called Get Into Rugby and in Oceania they've turned it into Get Into Rugby Plus which is looking at leadership development. So, so quite extensive and I know that the unions, you know, we, we've, we've had six executive leadership scholarships from the Oceania region um, and the unions are really committed to growing the game. Mm. And then on the governance side, what are, I think you said up to 30%, but what are the numbers of women in governance roles in World Rugby and the national unions and how do they measure up against your goals? Yep. Well, we started off pretty bleak, you know, to be, <laughs> to be clear, when I, when I started at World Rugby, um, the, the World Rugby Council was 30 men. So um, right away, that was a significant challenge. You know, we, we had a, we, our, our participation uh, from a woman's perspective was about 27% and we were governed by a panel of 30 men. Um, so that was the first thing that we needed to get right. And, you know, we, we have a, a woman's advisory committee, which is quite unique. And I know that the, you know, we get, we have a report card. All the international federations have a report card against things to do with gender equity that the IOC looks at on a regular basis. And they, they monitor how you're going against gender equity. And one of the things they look at is things like your, um, your women's advisory committees, do you have them? And we, we were given this kind of like gold star because our women's advisory committee is, is a very diverse committee. It is made up of four men and four women. And the four men happen to be the chairman, the vice chairman, the chief executive, and the vice pre um, president of France who chairs the committee. So very, very influential men sitting with some amazing women to actually drive the change. So, so basically the strategy got approved by that committee. And when we sat down and, and we were starting to talk about how we're we gonna set quotas for unions around the world, you know, I, I think it was, it was probably me that said, you know, we cannot set quotas for anyone until we address how we look and feel because there'll be a few stones being thrown back at us. And so, you know, there was a brainstorm session and a, um, uh, this concept came up on how we were going to um, increase our council by an extra 17 positions on the basis that they would be filled by women directors. Um, and that was championed by the committee um, with, with both Bill Beaumont and Gus Pichot, you know, driving that change across the world. So that was the start. So that meant that we set the scene for um, governance reform. Um, we at the same time developed a book, which you can get on our on, um, www.woman.rugby, which is a, a page it's called Balancing the Board, and it was a useful resource on how unions could address their own diversity challenges. Um, and I monitor them on a regular basis. So we've got a cohort of 20 organizations that we, we chose from the beginning of 2017. And we look at the changes that are taking place in terms of their governance, their senior leadership, their, um, their woman in coaching, and their senior match officials. And we track the changes on a six monthly basis um, with some specific targets of, of making sure that you know, you know, we're moving towards the 30%. We've got a long way to go, but some unions, I have to say, are, are absolutely amazing. You know, no sooner had we changed the World Rugby Governance Council where Canada, Rugby Canada, um, uh, drove a change to their constitution to say that they would have a minimum of, um, a minimum of 40% of either gender and a maximum of 60. So that's kind of gold star out there. Uh, but several other of the unions, I mean, Japan, I, I'll give this as an example all the time. I and mean, when we started this process in Japan, I think there was only one woman on their board. Um, uh, you know, when I was meeting with them in Tokyo last year um, during the Men's World Cup, they now have five. 
So we're seeing changes and that's really exciting. We're not there, we, we've still got a long way to go, but it's moving in the right direction. Yeah it's, yeah, it's great to hear. And it probably ties in a little bit going back to Australia and the situation with Raylene Castle and, and her decision to step down. And I guess there's been a, a lot of you over here about the, the perceived sexism or the things that she had to deal with, particularly in the media um, and how that is portrayed regarding leadership. Is that a, a barrier to women in the sport still? I, I mean, I, Raylene's a good friend and, um, you know, I, I have a, quite a long history within New Zealand sport. Um, uh, worked in, in both Sport New Zealand, um, High Performance Sport New Zealand, mm -hmm. both as a professional and as a director for a long period of time. So I have worked alongside Raylene um, for a very long time in terms of, you know, I guess when I was looking after the investment, uh, she was working at Netball in, in New Zealand. So I've known her for a very long time. She's an incredibly resilient woman. Um, and uh, is called upon often to um, talk about her leadership journey. And I know that, you know, just recently, and it was interesting, I sort of sent her a, a text just recently, and I was just reflecting um, on the fact that I, we had her involved in a leadership seminar in, in Fiji, where we had all the executive leadership scholarship women from, um, and the leaders from Oceania coming together to learn about leadership. And, and she talked about the challenges and then no doubt there is challenges um, and, and, and she um, faced a lot of them. Um, but she was, a good, she was a good leader and she, she has a lot of lessons to teach us all um, and we'll always have those lessons and I really look forward to catching up with her um, next time I'm down. Yeah, I'm sure. I've no doubt we will be seeing her somewhere again and something doing yep. something amazing. Um, going back, you mentioned the Try and Stop Us campaign and that global campaign which was launched last year. How have World Rugby perceived that success, uh, success rather? I mean, what were the sort of KPIs around that, that campaign? Yep. Um, it, it was kind of multifaceted. I mean, it, it, it linked to that, you know, we needed to, to create better product on the field, so the kind of high performance. We needed to lift the profile and create a brand opportunity so that we could then look at how we were going to capitalize on the commercial sector. Um, so there was there were targets associated with increasing participation numbers. There was targets associated with um, both our union engagement. So it wasn't just a global campaign. It was an integrated um, campaign where unions used it as well. I mean, down in, in, in New Zealand, one of the, the try and stoppers was, was Tracy, was Stacey Walker, Tracy, Stacey Fuller, um, who was clear and center in that campaign as well. So it was deliberately, we, we looked at identifying a group of unstoppables around the world in target markets that had the potential to either grow or had some major um, events that we wanted to capitalize on over the next two years. So it was the, it was the profile piece. There was a piece about changing perception. We have a, an annual um, survey um, where we use Nielsen, where we look at what people, what people's perceptions are, our fan engagement, um, and we wanted to measure people's attitudes towards women's rugby. Um, so there were some quite specific questions in there about that. And then it's also, you know, really importantly about driving a commercial program. Um, so getting out there, getting seen, getting exposed. And the campaign was incredibly, it was, was more successful and it's not finished. I should say it's, that was the first year of a three year campaign and probably over the next couple of months, you'll see some other stuff coming out. Um, and I'll just leave those as surprises. And they're definitely, there is a link towards that try and stop us and stop up campaign with what, with what we're trying to do down in New Zealand in rugby 2021. But it got massive traction. Um, you know, we had, you know, in the first four months, we had 9 million people look at our, um, our hero video. Um, we have been shortlisted and uh, for a variety of different awards. A lot of, a lot of, I've been invited to a lot of award ceremonies that are postponed. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's okay because it's still it's still in there in terms of um, uh, finals and it it certainly got buy-in and connection. Um, what we tried to do as well is is to expand it beyond the rugby family to the women's sports family. And I know that one of the first supporters of the campaign I, I wrote to was um, was because it wasn't a huge cost campaign. You know, rugby. You know. And I, and, I, and I would love to be in Soraya Behrman's shoes because football has got so much money compared to, to rugby. So we share a lot of knowledge and stuff like that, but I certainly don't have her budget. So it wasn't a high spend campaign. It really relied on um, a integrated social media, organic um, influencers spreading the word. And, I, and the kind of people that endorsed that campaign were amazing. And so the first one I wrote to was Billie Jean King. Um, you know, I just said to her, I said, I, you know, you don't know me. I've watched your video and, and you just, you know, one of my, the inspirational people of all women's sport and she got on board 
you know, she tweeted about it two or three times and she's been a really good supporter since. So it, it got us a way to connect with people. You know, like for example, when we changed the, the name um, to Rugby World Cup, removing the gender, she was one of the persons who got on board quite right away and said, fantastic world rugby, let's see others do this too. So yeah, great, great traction, it certainly got people talking um, and, it, and it kind of brought out some inspirational stories. So globally really good. And then, like I said before, I think I talked about Iran you know, before that, Nahid um, is uh, a woman from Iran who's on that campaign. She's the coach development manager. Um, pre uh, Try and Stop Us, there was about 3,000 women registered playing rugby in Iran. There's now over 10 in the year. So huge, huge traction. Awesome. Oh, it's, and it must, I must say, it's so nice to see all these familiar names popping up with the questions. I can't sort of say who everybody is, but hello, Fiona. Um, there are going to be more international sports events next year as a result of the postponements, obviously the Olympics being moved, the Euros as well. Uh, do you have any concerns for Rugby World Cup 2021 that it might get lost um, in, in the clutter or um, are there ways to mitigate that? This Rugby World Cup is... A pinnacle event of world rugby so it is a world cup event and you know it's interesting um mark egan who's our um head of competitions was on the bbc yesterday we not yesterday just just last week and we were talking about the challenges associated with the olympics and the rugby world cup being the same space and he says, said you know the, the the whole world of international competitions right now is just like one big jigsaw puzzle of people predicting and moving puzzles and sometimes they're fitting and sometimes they're not there is no doubt that there will be an there will be a congested uh, international competition calendar in 2021, um, and that you know one of the big things for us you know player welfare is absolutely fundamentally our first priority in world rugby. So sort of working out what that means in terms of making sure that there's not player overload and, and all that kind of stuff is going to be one of the challenges that we're going to have to address. There will be you know because people aren't cancelling competitions and well not in our sport they are postponing them so how they how they end up looking and feeling but what we can say is that two of the fixed ones at this stage are the olympic games and the rugby world cup in new zealand um and so we're working around uh the other um you know we you know one of the things that we did in that international competition high performance stream was that we have been focused on um i think i made mention to looking at a, a new global um competition calendar post 2022 but we've also been investing in unions um, for test series in the November series. And we had something like last year, about 58% increase in the number of tests that are being played by our, our top unions. We, um, we, have, we still have that money set aside to assist with the unions to actually, when we can, to get the competitions up and running. But we are gonna have to be really careful about how we, and you know, the, the really funny thing when I was thinking about um, the congested international competition calendar is that we're looking at it from our sports perspective, but from a fan and a, a, um, a punter's perspective, wow, it's going to be amazing because there's going to be so much sport across so many codes. So we're trying to make sure that the men's and the women's and everything actually fits in in a way that's, that provides safety for our players and, and the, the maximum return for our sponsors. But you can imagine the overlap with all the other codes that are doing the same thing. And I don't think there's the really big jigsaw puzzle sorted out yet. <laughs> lucky, lucky we've all had lots of practice at lying on the couch. Um, yeah. Sharon just popped up, so we've got another couple of minutes, so I'll whip through these. And speaking of Rugby World Cup 2021, hello Michelle Hooper, who is saying firstly thank you for, for championing the, and, and supercharging the women's game. But Michelle's just asking what your would be your key messages to women who work in the community side as volunteers in a variety of different roles. They are so important. I mean, you know, you know, I um, this global strategy that we adopted two years ago is about accelerating the global development of women in rugby. It's not about women's rugby. It's about women in rugby. They may be associated with the women's game. They may be associated with the men's game, but women are absolutely vital in terms of the core, the core of the club communities. Um, you know, whether it's the, the parents, whether it's the uh, keeping the clubs going, whether it's coaching on the sidelines, um, at all levels of the game, they're incredibly vital. And I think that's one of the initiatives that New Zealand Rugby are, are, are pushing in terms of their, their legacy and their impact beyond program is a, a program initiative to actually work with clubs to make them um, you know, woman, woman friendly or than maybe they are now in terms of um, understanding women's role in terms of governance and leadership and coaching um, and, and how, how friendly they are to, as a welcoming environment to get women on board. But yes, uh, uh, vital, vital, Michelle. 
And I'm probably just got time for one more and I will go to this one because it was the first one in there and it's from Ian Edgar who wants to also say hello and say thank you. Um, uh, but yeah. what, I know, it's like a reunion. Um, what, are you, what do you actually think, what's your view on the chances of Tokyo Olympics actually going ahead next year? Well, just that's, a very tricky tricky question. Question. that's a very tricky question. <laughs> um, hey, look at, uh, you know, I'm not... I'm not the Wizard of Oz, although I would like to be and look into the crystal balls and we can only deal with what we know now. Um, it, was, it was definitely the right call to change the Olympics. Um, and that, you know, there's been so much preparation in place from both the organizers, but more importantly, you know, the, the training that has gone on for, uh, you know, you know I, I competed at the Olympic Games a long, long time ago. Um, and I know how disappointed so many people would have been, you know, balancing the safety issue versus the, the disappointment with the training and can you keep it up for another year? Um, so I certainly hope that it does happen, but clearly, you know, the world is, an, is a different environment right now. Um, you know, if the Olympics isn't happening, then we've got some challenges for the Rugby World Cup in 2021 as well. So, you know, at this stage, we're planning ahead on the basis that it's happening. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, everyone, I didn't get to all the questions again, but I'm sure we can, hopefully they were sort of, some of them were covered and we can get get some of those through anyway. Thank you um, again so much, Katie, and, and for all your work. And, and yes, the infectious uh, attitude you're bringing to, to women's rugby, it's great to see. I'll hand over to Sharon to wrap things up and uh, and with today's poll, poll question, and, um, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Ricky. And yes, thank you, Katie. What a wonderful start to our Friday here in New Zealand and Australia. I love the energy. Um, I'll thank you formally in a moment. In the meantime, as our usual listeners know, there's a poll up in front of you. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill that out, and I'll give you the results of that in a moment. Um, Katie, it was brilliant. We covered so much this morning. You took us all over the world, and all the conversations you have are just unbelievable. I could have listened to you for much, much longer. Um, thank you for sharing so much on the strategy. You were so open and honest. And yes, that infectious energy, Ricky, I, I loved that as well. I also wanted to congratulate you. What really struck me was the, the way in which you create that connection with women in leadership and the encouragement you're giving to women and girls, not only in sport, but you know, into governance and leadership roles. It's something to be really proud of. And as a Kiwi sitting here talking to another Kiwi, thank you. It's brilliant. Um, you. On behalf of uh, the Circle, Sports Connect, and of course, Rachel and Women in Sport Aotearoa, thank you so much for your time. I'll hand over to you for the last word after I've shared the poll results. Um, so how is everyone feeling now? Innovative, which is great overall. Uh, we believe that the government generally is doing a great job, which is brilliant. Um, no surprises there that most people think 12 months for an estimate of when this will be over. And the priority of increasing the inclusion of women and girls, 69% think this is a high chance. So that's brilliant as well. So thank you so much again. And thank you, Ricky, for your time. Always brilliant to have you with us on a Friday. And Katie, I'll hand over to you for the last word. Well, uh, firstly, um, I hope you all have a wonderful day as I get ready to go to bed um, in New Zealand. I better do a shout out to my daughter, Abby, who's in Auckland, hopefully listening to me because she doesn't tend to listen to me very often. So um, um, hopefully there was some words of, of wisdom there for you, Abby. But, but most importantly, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to be a New Zealander. I know I sound really funny when people sort of say, oh, you, you can't possibly come from New Zealand, but I, I definitely, New Zealand is my home. And I'm, I'm really proud of the way that uh, the country has stood up and really a attacked this challenging environment that we're all facing globally. So it's really, it's really great to sort of read about all the great things that are happening down there. You know, keep up your spirits. Um, yeah, this, is, this is a time for leadership. Uh, and, you know, I, I have got the privilege of working with some amazing people around the world. And, and that is a really special opportunity but this is the time to lead. So um, I look forward to, to, to getting back to New Zealand, hopefully sometime this year, um, and definitely seeing as many of you as possible but during our World Cup in 2021.